Please join me in our responsive sentences. Praise the Lord, all the earth. Praise, Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights. Praise the name of the Lord, and the Lord's glory shall be praised. For people, for people near and people far, for people present and people to come, for the young and those wise with age. Come, let us praise the Lord. Come, let us worship God. Please join us in singing our opening hymn number 14, For the Beauty of the Earth. Be seated. Because we are loved, we are called to turn to God in humility in spite of falling short of who God calls us to be. Therefore, in faith and with confidence, let us now confess our sins to ourselves and to Almighty God. Let us join together in prayer. Holy God, you command us to love one another, yet we hold grudges, refuse to work for peace. You command us to care for all your creation, yet we neglect the earth and abuse nature through carelessness. You command us to walk in the ways of Jesus, yet too often we walk our own way. Forgive us, O oh God. Guide us as we work toward a new heaven here on earth. Lead us to reconciliation and a vision for your beloved community as we share your love with your people everywhere. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Good morning. We've got some of our um, new friends and our old friends here today. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> I just wanted to talk to you a little bit today about some things that we have going on um, with the um, FBI. And specifically, last Wednesday was our last session. And we had a game day. And Miss Molly missed it because she wasn't feeling well. But you were there, right? Did you have fun? Which game did you play? She doesn't remember. <laughs> did you do some drawing? <laughs> oh, when she played a matching game, yes. Um, one of the things, um, Molly hasn't heard this yet, and um, neither has Elizabeth, I don't think. But we had donated some money um, at our bingo party. We had donated $30 to the Salina Public Library, um, $55 to Rolling Hills Zoo, and $140 to the Ukraine Relief Fund that um, went through the church. Um, we got, I got a really nice phone call from the Salina Public Library thanking us for our donation. Plus, I got a, a thank you note from them today. But they were... I was really tickled because they seemed really pleased with the kids' um, gift, and they would like to um, drop something off for the kids as a thank you for their <laughs> gift. So um, we're wor trying to work through that. So it was very nice for the kids to be recognized for that. Um, and then today is our end of the year party, and we're going to the Rolling Hill Zoo. Are you guys coming? Are you planning to come to the zoo maybe? Not sure. <laughs> anyway, um, so everyone's meeting out there at the picnic area. So if you're listening and you're part of our group, this is just a reminder that we're meeting at the picnic area at 1 o'clock. And anyone in the congregation that would like to come join the kids and take a peek around the zoo, you're certainly welcome to do that. And then my last thing I'd like to visit with you about today is the Heartland Traveling Camp that takes place June 13th through the 17th, and so far we have, between our church and Sunrise Presbyterian, we have 17 kids signed up. We can have as many as 39, so um, we're starting to look outside of our small group of children that we serve, so if anybody in the congregation has nieces or nephews or grandchildren that might be visiting during the week of June 13th, or if you can make arrangements, they would certainly be welcome, and we'd like to include them. So get in touch with me if that's of interest to you. And then um, we're in need of a couple counselors yet. So if anybody is listening or if someone knows of, we need a 16-year-old or older counselor. We're looking for one of those. And then we're, we're also looking for a junior counselor that might be might have just finished seventh grade, but yet younger than 16. Um, and then also anybody is welcome to um, talk to me about uh, volunteering for the, uh, we're looking for some people to help with the crafts, but you do not have to make up the crafts. You don't have to put together any of the crafts. You just assist the kids with whatever they're having them do. And that's about an hour each day. So if someone's interested in helping with that, we are looking for volunteers for that. Anything else, anybody else wants to share? Are you excited about the zoo today? <laughs> okay, Miss Britton is. Okay, so let's say a prayer. Dear God, please bless these children today and all of our FBI kids and support them over the summer and keep them safe. Help us have a good day today out at Rolling Hills Zoo and also remember your animals and support them. Thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Loving Lord, may we joyfully hear your word 
so that we might unite, untie our faith, and unleash it in our lives. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Psalms 24, 1 through 6, and I'll be reading from the message. God claims earth and everything in it. God claims world and all who live on it. He built it on ocean foundations, laid it out on river girders. Who, who can climb Mount God? Who can scale the holy north face? Only the clean-handed, only the pure-hearted. Men who won't cheat, women who won't seduce. God is at their side. With God's help, they make it. This, Jacob, is what happens to God-seekers, God-questers. The grass withers, the flower, the flower fades, but the, the word of our God will stand forever. Thanks be to God.
though the choir may not have known how this sermon is going to go, they picked the perfect song for it. Our second reading this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, the 11th chapter beginning at the first verse. As with the earlier reading, this too comes from the message. So listen with new ears to this very familiar passage. The news traveled fast, and in no time the leaders and friends back in Jerusalem heard about it, heard that the non-Jewish outsiders were now in. When Peter when Peter got back to Jerusalem, some of his old associates, concerned about circumcision, called him on the carpet. What do you think you're doing, rubbing shoulders with that crowd, eating what is prohibited, and ruining our good name? So Peter started from the beginning, laid it out for them step by step. Recently, I was in the town of Joppa praying. I fell into a trance and saw a vision. Something like a huge blanket, lowered by ropes at its four corners, came down out of heaven and settled on the ground in front of me. Milling around on the blanket were farm animals, wild animals, reptiles, birds. You name it, it was there. Fascinated, I took it all in. Then I heard a voice. Go to it, Peter. Kill and eat. I said, oh no, master, I've never so much as tasted food that wasn't kosher. The voice spoke again. If God says it's okay, it's okay. This happened three times. And then the blanket was pulled back up into the sky. Just then three men showed up at the house where I was staying, sent from Caesarea to get me. The Spirit told me to go with them, no questions asked. So I went with them, I and six friends, to the man who had sent for me. He told us how he had seen an angel right in his own house, real as his next-door neighbor, saying, send to Joppa and get Simon, the one they call Peter. He'll tell you something that will save your life. In fact, you and everyone you care for. So I started in talking. Before I'd spoken half a dozen sentences, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as it did on us the first time. I remember Jesus' words. John baptized with water. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So I ask you, if God gave the same exact gift to them as to us, when we believed in the Master Jesus Christ, how could I object to God? Hearing it all laid out like that, they quieted down. And then, as it sank in, they started praising God. It's really happened. God has broken through to the other nations, opened them up to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Earlier this week, I read an article that had just been published in the Atlantic magazine by 
a man named Tim Alberta. This article was entitled, How Politics Poisoned the Evangelical Church. Alberta, a son of an evangelical pastor, had reviewed the last 40 plus years of how the church had become so politicized and concluded in his article by saying, the church is not a victim of America's civic strife. It's one of the principal catalysts. Now, even though he was looking at the evangelical scene, what I hear from my reform position is that what he was saying could easily be transferred over into the mainline churches of America. It's a warning to us, a condemnation, if you will, that we've lost our spiritual, ethical influence and purpose. That being sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. People aren't listening to us. People are pushing the church aside. I also believe Alberta's article, though, can help us to see what we're doing, what we're not doing, and what we need to be doing to resuscitate dying congregations, not only in our denomination, but across the country in all forms of it. But we have to first admit, like we do in our prayer of confession, that we have become complacent in allowing the secular world to take control of our religious institutions and our influence in communities. We've allowed our spiritual values to be kidnapped by secular elements to the point that we fooled ourselves into thinking that we have a one-size-fits-all spirituality requiring very little from us. It's adherence. So what do we do here? How are we going to respond? Are we going to let things continue to go the direction they're going? For we can easily see where that's leading. Or are we going to answer the call that's been laid before us? I think we need to start by remembering what Peter discovered and encountered in his own vision. And we have to begin to look outside the box of what we have been doing all these years. Because we need to find new ways to minister to Christ's people especially those who aren't sitting here in this congregation today. Now, before going any farther, I need to also say, I have always felt that a minister coming into a new congregation isn't there to change everything, but rather is there to be almost, if you will, a chameleon. In that, if anything changes, it should be his or her ideas of how to do things. Yes, in partnership with the leadership of the congregation, but not coming in with a heavy hand. And not changing 
what is truly important. The clergy person's values, core beliefs, nothing should be changed there. But what we need to all be doing is seeking to find ways of taking our faith traditions, whether it be local or uh, institutional, and adjusting them to being heard in new and different ways and yet be sincere and honest in reflecting Christ's agenda. For you see, Jesus came and spoke in a new manner, with a new language, to the people. He realized that the breadth of those who were listening needed to be addressed. It needed to be made real for them. Those fishermen, those laborers, those farmers, those men and women, the accountants, the chefs, the cleaners, the lepers, the poor, the wealthy, the disenfranchised, the theologians, the people with special needs. He knew the language to use to touch their hearts, each and every one of them. And we need to find that language and touch their hearts as well. Could that be what we have been called to do today? Could that be what we have been called to proclaim? To talk to people in a language of faith, but a language that they understand and can relate to. One that they can not only take in, but believe in. The fact is, I think we have lost our, their trust and we have lost our influence and we need to find ways to regain it once more. Alberta discovered this also as he referred to a Gallup poll that said that in 1975 more than two-thirds of Americans expressed, quote, a great deal of confidence in the church, unquote. More than two-thirds. Even in 1985, organized religion was the most revered institution in American life. However, today, just 37% of Americans find confidence in the church. So, where do we look for where this erosion is happening? Who do we point the finger at? I'm afraid we need to be looking in the mirror because that's where it lies. For each one of us, as disciples of Jesus Christ, whether we're sitting in this sanctuary or listening to it on the radio or through the internet, each one of us is responsible for where the church finds itself today. And we need to find ways, as I said, of regaining the trust and the confidence of the people so that they can know and understand what it means to have a life based in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can no longer be wishy-washy or lackadaisical about what we do or what we believe because this, my friends, is serious business and if we aren't willing to pay the price to do what needs to be done, then let's lock the doors today and be done with it. It has to start with us recognizing our own responsibilities, and it has to start today 
with acknowledging that we have fallen short and that we need to respond to bring back the spiritual direction and influence that the Church of Jesus Christ has been called on for centuries to proclaim. And I'm wondering now to myself, maybe we need to look at a different approach than what we've been doing. Because that approach may be archaic, what was happening in the past. It doesn't relate to the people who are outside the doors. It relates to the choir, to us. But we need to find a way to bring it to life for those who are, fr frankly, biblically illiterate. They haven't been raised in the gospel. They haven't been raised with the knowledge of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. They haven't been raised with the ethical nature of what is contained in the scriptures. And sadly, we're seeing it as a nation this day. And I think Peter understood this fact. And he was willing to accept the challenge that was laid before him. Whether he was aware of the full magnitude of it or not, he was willing to accept the challenge to expand his ministry to a larger segment of society. He realized that the gospel was to be heard by a broader audience of hungry souls. And he's reminding us today that we need to make that recognition also and think outside the box as to how we can share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with one and with all. Now, I want to make sure that I don't leave you thinking something that I'm not trying to say. I'm not trying to say toss the baby out with the bathwater, if you will, because that's not the case. But what I'm saying here, more to myself than to any of you, is that our strength, is in knowing the message that we've been given over the centuries. And our strength is to find new ways of sharing that old story to people who are desperately in need of it, so desperate that they don't even know that they need to hear it. And we need to change some things within how we approach all of this. A friend of mine years ago, not that many years, I'm still younger, uh, told me that he had been visiting some people on vacation. I don't know where it was. I don't remember if he told me that. But they lived in a gated community. And so he got permission to go in and uh, was, he and his wife were staying with them for a couple of days and they were playing golf and tennis and different other things. And he saw that they had a church in this gated community. And as he drove by it, he noticed a lawn sign, a big lawn sign out there. <coughs> and it stood out to him. It said, Believe it or not, members always welcome. <clears throat> now, I know what they were trying to say. The members of the gated community were always welcome to come. But think about it a second. What if we put outside on 8th Street or 9th Street a sign that said, members always welcome? What's the unspoken message? 
It's so easy for us to unintentionally proclaim a message to a select group of people. Unintentionally saying we only want our kind. Oh Lord, forgive us for we know not what we do. It's far too easy and certainly far too comfortable for us to practice what I would call their spiritual nepotism, only focusing the gospel on those we have previously selected. And by doing that, we unintentionally and silently kill unconditional love, the very love that Jesus lived for and died for. So what can we do to reclaim that path that reflects what we truly believe and what honors Christ's gospel? There could be many suggestions that we could all come up with, but let me just highlight two this morning. The first is we need to be vigilant in honoring that simple yet profound commandment that Jesus Christ gave to us. Love one another. Note here, it's love one another. It's unconditional love he's speaking of. It's not a love that we attach to a specific person. It's not a social or societal group that we are looking toward. It's not exclusively a nation that we are considering. It's not only those who believe what we believe, but it's all of God's creation that we are to love. Each and every one of them. No matter their skin color, their place of origin, their sexual orientation, their political persuasion, their citizenship, or anything else. Everyone needs to receive the gospel message. And it's not to be delivered in a sort of, kind of, well, I'll get back to you. It's to be given with enthusiasm, with sincerity, with honesty, with genuine authenticity. For as the Lord has given to you, so you also must give. Secondly, we're to live out we're to live out your mission statement, which is one of the most beautiful mission statements that stands out to me time and time again. To be frank with you, my friends, it's what captured me as I was meeting with the uh, search committee looking for a transitional minister. The part of it says that stood out to me is led by Christ together in faith and love we joyfully think question grow and serve I hope you memorize that and that you try to live that out each and every day because if you just even try to do that you will be successful for this is who you are. And that's what you need to wake up to each and every morning with your hearts full of excitement at sharing that very proud message of hope for one and for all. I hope you embrace it. I hope you live it. And I certainly hope you love it. Don't be afraid. 
Don't be afraid of what God has called you to do here at First Presbyterian Church. Here in this community that you've served for now over 162 years. Accept the challenges. Yes, be prepared for the criticisms and the rejections. Those are going to be there. But know that if you're faithful, if you're soul-driven and sincere, you will hear a response, an amazing response coming forth. And you, I believe, with all sincerity, I believe, you will witness unbelievable ministry taking place for many, many years to come. In the name of God, the creator, the sustainer, and the redeemer. Amen. Would you please stand if you're able as we join together in our affirmation of faith laid before you from a brief statement of faith where we proclaim that we trust in God whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live in one community. But we rebel against God, we hide from our Creator, ignoring God's commandments. We violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God calls with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In every the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. And let us continue to affirm our faith as we sing hymn number 754, Help Us Accept Each Other, 754. Please be seated.
before we enter into prayer, just a few announcements. Please make note of those that are printed in the bulletin, but I need to highlight a few. Uh, I've been informed that May 29th, that's it, May 29th, there's a race going on somewhere in this country that seems that to happen at the same time as worship here. The Indianapolis 500 will be taking place. So KINA Radio will be broadcasting that, but we will be on, if you're normally listening to the service, we will be on at 3 o'clock that day. So please make note of that, those who may be listening to us. Uh, I also want to highlight a few things. Already, some of it has been shared with you, but let me just quickly highlight again that today, FBI, that is Faithful Bible Investigators, will be meeting at the zoo at 1 o'clock for their end-of-year party. The middle schoolers and high schoolers will meet next Sunday at 1 o'clock at the alley for their last uh, hurrah, if you will, f through the summer. And you see a big note here about Project Salina. There is a goal set for this year for Project Salina. For us, we have set a goal of $2,400. So throughout the month of May, we will be doing our level best to try to raise that amount. So all I'm going to say is please give, give, give. Already this year, we have seen an increase of over 47% needs in the year 2022. So please know that though we may think things are going well, there are people still suffering and in need of assistance. And finally, next Sunday, uh, I'm sure the sanctuary will be packed. I won't be preaching. Uh, but we have a very accomplished preacher coming here for this special occasion. Next Sunday, we will be celebrating the gifts of women, and there's ex some extremely fine and talented ladies in our congregation who will be leading us in worship, and Amanda Littell will be sharing the good news of the gospel, proclaiming that gospel through the gift of preaching. So please plan to attend for that. And now as we enter into prayer, I would ask you to please remember and celebrate Helen and John Smuts' 76th anniversary. 76 years. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, which will be on Tuesday, the 17th. But also keeping your thoughts and your prayers. Teresa Cooper, who is our young adult volunteer working very hard in Dundee, Scotland. And let us also remember the people of Ukraine and the victims and families of those who have been affected by the, the murders in Buffalo, New York that took place yesterday. So with that in mind, let us pray. O oh God of love, we pray for the well-being of your creation, that we may promote its ability to offer praise to you through spacious skies, bountiful seas, verdant lands, and precious creatures, great and small. We pray for the life of Christ's church, that our generous witness may be broadened so that all may hear and receive what they are seeking in life. We pray for the welfare of your world, that all leaders and people, young and old, may strive to live together in harmony while serving the common good. We pray for all who suffer, who suffer any violence, pain, or grief, 
that they will know the comfort of your presence as you wipe away every tear from their eyes. We pray for the love made known to us in Jesus Christ through this community, for this, and all other blessings. O oh Lord, we give you thanks and praise. And we pray for all who have died, that you will bring them to the fullness of your joy, where mourning and pain will be no more. Gracious and loving Spirit, you have blessed us in so many ways and you've answered our prayers. Sometimes with our understanding and sometimes beyond our understanding. But we do give you thanks. We give you thanks for all that you have done for us. Especially through the one who is risen. The resurrected Christ whose prayer we join in saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The ministry at First Presbyterian Church is important and it has touched more lives than we could ever imagine and it continues to do so every day. Thank you for your generosity and we hope you will continue to support the congregation's ministry. There are many ways to express your support. You can place your gift in the offering plates at the back of the sanctuary. You can send your gift by mail, by text message, or through our website. And as for our church members, you can give through the Church's Realm Act application. Now, let us give thanks to God as we listen to this morning's offertory. Let us pray. Loving God, we give thanks for the ministry of reconciliation to which you call us in the name of Jesus Christ and his res resurrection. Accept these gifts for your mission to heal all creation. May they be a testament to your love to us as we share them in love for you. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Please join in our closing hymn number 300, We Are One in the Spirit.
So as you go out from here this day, go out knowing that you have a calling, a calling to share the good news of the gospel with one and with all. Do it with love, and God's love will be expanded outward, touching the lives of so many people. For God loves one and all, this day and always. So go out with that love, God's peace and God's fellowship, now and always. Go in peace. Shalom.